You're listening to Sports Connections with David Smale, the show that brings you a fun and intimate look into connections throughout sports. Now here's your host, David Smale. Joel Goldberg came to Kansas City in 2008 to become the first sideline reporter for the Kansas City Royals for Fox Sports Kansas City. He has given the role its own personality, interacting with the play-by-play voices and the color analysts, which is a challenge in and of itself. We'll leave it at that, as well as interviewing players, managers, and fans before, during, and after games. My mom turns on Royals Live before the games, not to find out who's pitching or who's hot or who's not. She turns in, tunes in, rather, to see what Joel has to say about the game. In fact, she just says, I can't talk anymore. I'm going to watch Joel. Since arriving in Kansas City, he has witnessed the rise of the Royals to consecutive American League pennants in 2014 and 2015 and the 2015 World Championship. He became and continues to be an integral part of the Royals broadcast team and the overall Kansas City community. He has, he's also released his first book, which he'll tell us about shortly. Joel, welcome to Sports Connections. David, good to be with you. Great to, uh, to see you, so to speak, in the offseason. Yeah, I can't wait until we can see each other face to face again at Coffin yeah. Stadium. I hope that's I hope that's early this season. We don't have to go through another year like last year. I'm going to start with this, um, and this is just for you personally. Do you have the best job in the world? Yeah, I I believe so, and I think that there are others that should feel the same way. And I don't think that you have to be in sports to feel the way that I do. But I will say that if you are in sports and don't feel the way that I do something is wrong. And that doesn't mean that every job in sports and broadcasting and print and media is the greatest ever. As a matter of fact, it really took me getting to Kansas City and settling into this job to truly believe that I had the best job ever. I love what I do. It's a blast. It's a lot of work. It's fulfilling work. But, you know, it was a lot of years to get here. And every step of the way, I loved it. Because who wouldn't love being paid to talk about sports if you're a sports fan? Right. I'm very fortunate, and, and I think about that every day. Yeah, and, and you did talk about the, uh, the hard work. Some people would say you have the easiest job in the world just talking about baseball with professional baseball players and managers and that. But it is a lot of work. How much preparation goes into a day's pregame broadcast? And I know you've got a lot more than just pregame, but the pregame is about the only thing you can prepare for. So how much, how much time do you spend preparing for uh, a pregame show? Yeah, it's just an interesting balance. Uh, I mean, first off, you know this, and I think a lot of people do, maybe not everybody. I'm always amazed when people kind of think that we show up, you know, three minutes before a game or whatever it is. And look, I'm not going to sit there and tell anyone this is rocket science, but you can't just roll out of bed and do it. Right. I, I do think that Many of us are capable of pulling that off if we have to, meaning if something is going on personally in life and you're you know, held up with family or putting out fires and you have to show up somewhat last minute, we have such a good team around us. Yeah. And equally important to that, we are all around this so much that you're not stepping into foreign territory. You're not stepping in to something that you're uncomfortable with. And that's the beauty of baseball is that you do it every single day. And it's day after day after day. So I I think in some ways, my preparation has become easier over the years as I have sort of figured out my own routine. Don't waste your time on researching this because you're never going to use it. Spend more time focusing on that because you will use it. These are the right people to to talk to. These are the wrong people to talk to. And, you know, there's so much, and you know this, David, there's so much once you get to the ballpark standing around waiting for something that could happen right now, or it might be in three hours. And so you do a lot of standing around and I'm constantly trying to look things up or do other things to take advantage of that time. So it really never stops or slows down, but I think that the more you're around it, and I also think that the more that you build long-term relationships with everyone involved, that could be other members of the media, certainly players, coaching staff, medical personnel, on and on, the easier it becomes to get what you need because if they trust you, you don't have to jump through hoops to get it. And that really can help with the workload too. Yeah, and if, if you, with those relationships, if suddenly somebody is traded, it may not even be a member of, of the Royals, it may be somebody that one of the Royals used to play with. And that's a big story nationally. 
you have those relationships where you can go up and talk to Salvi or Danny Duffy or Ian Kennedy or pick a player and say, hey, did you hear so-and-so got traded? What do you think? How do you think he'll fit in the new place? And you're just having a conversation with a friend, not, I mean, yes, you're doing your job, but you're doing your job by having a conversation with a friend. Right. And for instance, somewhat recently, Royals acquire Carlos Santana. It's not a matter of moments until I have a scouting report. And when I say scouting report, in his case, I don't mean so much what type of a baseball player is he. We've seen that against the Royals for yeah. years, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's immediately getting text messages or phone calls from my counterparts in Cleveland or vice versa. Hey, this guy is great with this. You should ask him about that. And so, you know, it's a pretty small circle. And we all have so many resources. For me on the broadcast end, whether it's the Joel Goldberg in Cleveland or whether it's the Jeff Montgomery in Cleveland, or whether it's the play-by-play guy in New York, or it's the beat writer you know, in Minneapolis, or it's the PR guy in whatever town, we build those relationships, especially within the division where we see them so many times a year, that it's not difficult to get what you need. It was a little bit more challenging, obviously, during the pandemic. So you picked up the phone and you got on Zoom calls instead of maybe you know getting to the ballpark. And you know we spend a lot of time chatting on the field or going to the opposing broadcast booth or the press box and just catching up with people. Yeah. Hey, what's a good story? What's going on with this person? What was he like here? How did he end up with this? You know, and on and on and on. And it's amazing how we all are able to help each other out, which enables us all obviously to be a lot smarter. Yeah. And, and the nice thing to, to, for fans to realize is that you're not on an Island. You're doing this. And Jason Benetti with the, with the White Sox is doing the same thing. So he, he might be on your show one day and you're going to be on his the next day. And it works for both of you. I, to me, during the pandemic, I loved when I wasn't at the game, I, I loved watching you guys do the pregame chats with the Jason Benettis and, and people like that, the Mark Gubazas with the Angels, because you are sharing similar experiences and just basically just being friends. I think that's the biggest part of what comes through on your broadcast is you're talking to your friends. They just happen to be professionals at something most people would love to even be able to still do uh, recreationally. Yeah. And it's sometimes still mind boggling to me that I could pick up the phone and text Steve stone and get a reply back. And I'm like, I watched him as a kid (laughs) with the Cubs and, you know, and now he's a a resource for me and he's, very accessible. And I could sit there and say, Hey, Stoney, can you come on with us today? Or his partner, Jason Benetti, or to uh, sticking with the Chicago theme to, to have been walking through the broadcast level and have Hawk Harrelson back before he retired, say, Hey, come on, come on in Joel, come, come chat for a little bit yeah. and to be able to be welcome like that. And so I feel like my job, which is as much, I would say uh, people gatherer and storyteller as it is reporter. And that all obviously comes with it. It's a unique role. And it's one when you say, do you have the greatest job in the world? I actually really believe that I do because I don't know any other market that has one guy that hosts every pre and post game show and does every sideline report without sharing those responsibilities with someone else. It's a product of being in a smaller market where we don't have an NBA and an NHL team, meaning that Fox sports doesn't have any other properties right. among the four big sports. Um, they certainly have done their stuff with sporting in the past, but you know, it's, it puts me in this unique role to, to be up close front and center and have access that no one else has. So part of, to me, my role in storytelling and people keeping people not just informed, but entertained is to be able to share that with everyone at home. So when you mentioned David that, Hey, this is just you having your friends on, that really resonates with me because whether they're like my good friends or just people that I know well from the game, that includes a Salvador Perez or, uh, you know, an Eric Hosmer when he was here and Alex Gordon. If I have the relationship with these guys, uh, most of whom I wouldn't say, hey, that's my good friend, right. but that I've built that trust and relationship and I get a chance to share that personality and give someone sitting at home, whether it be you or your mom or whoever it is, a little bit of a peek behind the curtain. I think everybody wins with that. And that's to me an, an incredible responsibility and, and a really rewarding aspect of the job. 
I want to talk about a different part of your job. And to me, this would be the really hard thing, though. Maybe it's not too different from what I do, having to write a game story and file it within five minutes of the last out. How hard is it for you to capsulize your thoughts about the whole game for regurgitation for 30 minutes? Just, I mean, basically you got the, the you got Ryan and Rex or, or Fizz and Rex in the, in the booth recapping the game really quickly while you run from the dugout to the outfield uh, set to get ready. How difficult is that to get that ready to go to appear so fluid and, and flawless in a different role where you're recapping? Yeah, I, I guess I don't think about it. And sorry, to, sorry to bring it up. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's actually a good question because I, you know, I think it's like the same thing. Like if I were to say to you, and then I'll, I'll take this a step further because it doesn't really serve, you know, anybody that is is checking out the podcast to say, well, it's just what I do. And, but I, you know, it's like if I were to say to you, how do you how do you get that that game story filed on a deadline? It's well, that's just that's what I do. And you know, you couldn't have done it as well twenty years ago as you do it now, and I couldn't have done this twenty years ago as well. And also, you, you know as well as I do that they're not all winners. I mean, you, right. you know, sometimes I do it better than others, and sometimes. I fail, which is obviously not what I want, but it's okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's live television. It's going to happen. So sometimes it works better than others. Some days it's just presented to you on a platter. And you know, this as a writer that you don't have to sit there and, and, and work hard to figure out what to write because it's already been written in some ways for you. Sometimes you got to scratch that at the last minute and move on to something else. That's the game. I mean, I will tell you that when I am standing down, in the camera well, getting ready to do a post-game interview if the Royals are winning or if that game is close, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, if he hits it, then it's <laughs> going to be this question. I mean, like, you know that the first question is going to be some form of a how does it feel, which I hate to ask that question. So, But put it in those lines. What just happened on that play? Tell yeah. me about the big play. What was the thought process? Something along those lines. So if I'm generally going to get three questions is typically what it would be with the guest and if the game look if a guy went four for four or three for four and has five rbi and they're winning handily i i know who it's going to be and i have time to think about it right but it happens a lot where and this is kind of fun where i'm standing in the camera well and i don't know and you're kind of going through the next one two three four batters now you got to take it another step further this guy doesn't speak English. So we're going to need a translator. So we need to make sure that happens. Or this guy really isn't comfortable talking. There aren't many like that, but if it's him, who else can I get? Well, this guy's a good talker. He went, you know, one for four and had a walk, but that walk was a big moment. Is that worth the interview? So you're running through all these yeah. things in your head. Now here's where it gets kind of quirky and fun is if the Royals lose, I don't get that interview on the field. That's the way baseball is. It comes right. from the winning team. So it is much more beneficial for me if we're at home to be out on our post-game set, which is in left field. There is no like direct catapult to get me out there or <laughs> escalator, walking escalator. Yeah. Like you got to weave and I've got little back door tricks to go underneath here and up through there, but I, I do have to emerge at some point. I do have to kind of fight through the crowds a little bit. The cameras are all watching me because they're stalling to get to a commercial break from Ryan and Rex or, or Fizz and Rex so that I could be there to start on time. And so I've got to get going there. Now, it's to my benefit to be out there if they're losing. But if the game is in limbo, which way do I go? And I can't tell you how many times nobody sees this, that I start inching my way to left field. And now the tying run <laughs> is in the on-deck circle. So I stop. Now the tying run comes to the plate and the game would potentially game winning run is in the on deck circle. Now I start moving back towards home plate. Now that guy gets on and the potential winning run walk off fashion is coming to the plate and one swing of the bat and I have to be on the field. Now I'm hightailing it either if there's an elevator available or I'm running down the stairs and I still have to wind my way back down towards the dugout. And, and so I know this all sounds like, Oh, it's not that it's tough. It's just like, I'm like, which it's like the old, which way do I go? Which way do I go? Am I here? Am I here? Am I here? Am I here? Oh, I think I got to be here. Nope. I got to be there. And so it's like back and forth and back and forth. Oh, by the way, there's a post game show starting in the next three or four minutes. Yeah. And so I think that's where you, and this gets back to what you're saying. One, you trust your partner. And I've been working with Jeff Montgomery for 10 plus years. So 
he he'll joke all the time that I may sit down as the music is starting to the show and he'll just write on a piece of paper. Here's where we're going first. Oh, oh, okay. Like I don't have time to say, let's go here. Let's do this because the adrenaline and everything's yeah. going. And that just comes to paying attention during the game, writing down some scenarios, chit chatting back and forth, communicating with the producer and it's fluent. I mean, it's, it's, our post game show is not scripted, and a lot of it is based on okay. Mike Matheny is available. Go to the press conference. We got this sounding. Go to that, and yeah. then you start piecing things together. I think that's a lot of fun, though. Yeah, and and it, you guys do it so well, you and Monty, and and even when you get HUD on there, and just the whole thing looks like it was pre recorded. It's so smooth most of the time, and then there's sometimes when your suit coat is is wet because you just got dumped on. And it, it's very obvious that you're ad living, and that's fun too. I I, I think it's I, knowing you, uh, you know, as well as I do, and knowing what you're doing, it makes it more fun for me to watch. But for the casual fan, it just looks effortless, and I guess that's a good compliment for you to come across that way. When I know there's a lot of effort that goes into it, and, and I, you know, I'm not sure that it's as smooth as you make it out to be, or maybe, maybe you perceive it in a better way than I do. And that just might be some, you know, self-doubt or criticism in my head, but I'm okay with that too. I mean, we all are going to see things. We're all going to see it differently. That's the subjective business we're in. But my point to that is I, I have always wanted our show to sound like two guys sitting at a bar talking about baseball. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm I don't know that I'm, you know, rechanneling, the, the you know the the Saturday Night Live guys the the Bears guys, but I I don't <laughs> want it to be this scripted. Yeah. How was this? How was this? How was this? I want it just to go back and forth. And we're at a point now where Monty doesn't always know where I'm going, and I may not know where he's going, but I know ninety nine percent of the time he's gonna pick up wherever I you know, whatever I give him and vice versa. And if I'm struggling or I miss something, he'll pick me up. And if he's struggling and the only time it really doesn't work is if somehow somebody was trying to talk in his ear and he didn't hear a question I asked her, sometimes you get those little things right, right. and I could see it in his, in his face, like, Oh, he has no idea what I just asked him. Okay. <laughs> let me pick him up. But there's an incredible trust level there. And yeah. this will be about the only time in my life that I've ever done this, but there's like this, this chemistry that a Patrick Mahomes and a Travis Kelsey have. See, I'll never do that again. But you know, <laughs> which you one are you? you say which like, which yeah. one are you? Are you are you Mahomes? I, I guess I have to be Mahomes. Although you know, everybody <laughs> would tell you that Monty's a thousand times more athletic than me, even if he's ten years older than me. So he should really be both of them. And I, <laughs> if I was lucky, I guess I'd be Andy Reid. I, I don't know, uh, or the guy in the practice squad maybe. But there's this trust and chemistry between yeah. us that does remind me of when when we're sitting and we're watching the homes, you go, how did he find Kelsey? How did like my wife, who's not a huge sports fan or huge football fan. Every time she's like, how do those two do it? And not that anything that Monty and I are doing um, anything at that level. And I would include our, our crew in that too, behind the scenes, but we've done it for so long together that there's, there's never a fear factor, Yeah, you know, and it's, and, and not every pass is going to be completed and there are going to be flaws and flubs and, and look, David, I don't want, don't use and prefer not to have a teleprompter. First off, that post game show would be impossible to script anyway. Right, right. And to me, it's just my style. The pregame show, while we know where where we're going almost every time, unless something goes wrong or there's breaking news, a last minute trade or an injury or somebody pulled out of the lineup, something like that, I still want to know here's where we're going. And then let's talk about it. Right. What's the sound bite? I'll get you to the sound bite. I don't want to sit there and say, and Mike Matheny said, this is a must win. And then you hear Mike Matheny saying, this is a must win. Like, I want to know right. without stepping on it, um, how best to go about that. But I want it. And I think this is a, it's not just a Kansas City thing, but I think this is just less of the big market, New York, LA type of thing. I don't think we need to be all Rico Suave smooth on, smooth on this thing. I just think we have to be real and, and we have to be like like what anybody would, would get from us if they saw us at the grocery store. Sure. What, which is harder for you on the post game? Um, and I'll give you like three or four options. A Royals blowout win, a Royals walk-off win, a game where we had no pitching and to back it up, we had no hitting you know, a, an embarrassment, which is the hardest post game show to do? Oh, the, um, 
for without a doubt, the the blowout loss had no chance is the hardest thing because and people will say to us, oh, man, how did you deal with that one? And I'm like, well, I've been dealing with ones like that forever. Yeah. And that's not even sitting there saying, well, the Royals have had bad years. I, I, anyone in my role, even if your team wins at the winning percentage of someone like the Yankees or whatever, you have enough blowouts and bad games. And those are the hard ones because – even if a blowout win is anticlimactic, you have a lot of storylines. These five guys each had two RBI, or the last time that this many players had this many RBI was 1987. And hey, Monty, do you remember that year? I mean, like, there, there's, yeah. But when, when you have that blowout loss or that dud, it might not even be a blowout loss. It might be, you know, a, a, a three to nothing loss where you had two hits and, it's against a guy that you feel like they should have hit better. It's not against a Cy Young and it's like, and, and the defense was a little shoddy and it's like, meh, this one doesn't feel very good. And typically, you know, this, it doesn't usually just happen once. There could be four or five of those in a row yeah. where you're like, by the fourth one, you're like, can, can we recue yesterday's show? Cause this <laughs> one feels like the same, but y- you know, I'm constantly reminded that someone's always watching, that someone always cares, no matter how much we might hear from some fans that say, you know, I might tweet out after the game, Royals lose their fifth straight, three nothing, offense continues to struggle, and somebody will inevitably tweet, uh, who cares, or well, I'm not going to watch that one, and I'm like, that's cool, but somebody will, and by the way, thanks for tweeting, but Someone's always paying attention, you know, and so we owe it to them to give it our best effort. Is the energy level and the excitement level going to be the same after a blah game? No, but I I think that's what makes it harder is you have to create it a little bit better. You can't sell something that's not true. Uh, I am not the guy, nor will I ever be the guy that is beating the heck out of athletes or team. And I know I'm in a role where I, I, it's not suited for that, but that's always been my personality. I I find, especially when you build trust with guys that the truth is the truth, the facts are the facts. So I I have no problem saying, Hey, you know, so-and-so player, Salvador Perez is struggling right now. He's over his last 16 and and this one's eating him up or, or whatever it is. There's a way to still focus on and cover the downtimes or the negative without being a bad guy, so to speak, without beating them up. And I have to be able to coexist with these guys, you know, up to 160 games a year and traveling with them and all of that. But that doesn't mean I have to sit there and say, boy, they're doing great when they're clearly struggling. Right. I think it's it's not so much what you say, it's how you say it. And, and I think that's how I make my living. And I think that kind of transitions into the next topic that I want to talk about. You have become to a lot of fans, almost as popular as the players. You've been there longer than any of the players. Now that Alex is retired, you've been there longer than any of the players or coaches. Is this role what you expected when you took it, especially since the Royals had never had anyone in that, in that role? It's not what I expected. I mean, it exceeded expectations. Uh, I'll, I'll start with this. And I get your point. I will never... I, I, I get exactly your point. I will never be more popular or well-known or whatever it is than the players, nor should I be. As Dave Moore has said many times, uh, not just pertaining to me, this it's a player's game. Like, right. you know, at the end of the day, Dayton might be the boss, but they're coming to see Salvador Perez play, right? I, I may be visible and, you know, I always say like, all right, if I if I was walking down the street on one side in Kansas City and Salvador Perez was walking down the street on the other side, nobody would notice me. <laughs> now, if Salvi's walking down the street on one side and Patrick Mahomes is walking down the street on the other side and I want to get somewhere quickly, I'll go hang out with, with Salvi and everybody's going to go to Mahomes, right? It's all It's all perspective. The reason why, to your point, people may know me more is because I've come into their living room pretty much every night for 13 years. And they will get to know Bobby Witt Jr. in the future. They will get to know Brady Singer more the way that they now do Danny Duffy. They will get to know 
uh, you know, Asa Lacey or some of these names that are coming up over time. But with the way sports are nowadays, and we all know this, the day and age of George Brett being on one team his whole career is almost non-existent. Alex Gordon was, I think, the, the outlier there. So as long as they're still paying to put me on TV, which could end at any point, I mean, there, were, there was a few years ago where someone yelled over from the dugout, hey, Joel, it's your birthday, right? Yeah, happy birthday. And I, I look over, I'm like, thanks. And then I look, I think we were in Detroit, and I see Adalberto Mondesi and Brad Keller. And I'm like, those guys were born on the same exact date and year. Right. And I'm like, okay, until those two have their birthday at the end of July, I am older than the two of them combined. <laughs> and so, you know, the players keep getting younger and we keep getting older. And as long as they have me doing this, I will have appeared on people's TV sets longer than the athletes. But I think as long as I remember that, that the reason, my reason of being here is to tell their stories. So they will always be more important. And if people happen to know me and feel a comfort level with me, then that's, that's about the greatest honor you can get. That's not anything that I signed up for or understood right. what I was getting into. All I knew in the most innocent of TV ways is that leaving St. Louis to come here, which was my choice, was going to give me more airtime, a lot more airtime. That's what we all want in TV. Yeah. Once you start getting that airtime, you understand that you actually have a responsibility with it. And it's interesting with talking about the age. One day I wore a, a, a polo shirt into the locker room and it was a shirt I got for covering the Olympics in Atlanta, covering basketball. And I walked by Brad Keller and he's like, oh, I like your shirt. And I said, well, thank you. He said, yeah, I'm from Atlanta. And he said, my mom and dad and, and one of my sisters were at some of the games in, in, at the Olympics. And I said, well, didn't you go? He goes, no, I was one year old. And I said, shut up. And I turned around and walked away. Yeah. <laughs> These are young kids. And, and every once in a while, we're reminded of how young they are. Yeah. And we were there once, just like, like anyone else. And I, I think he's July 27th, 1995, along with Adalberto Mondesi. And I think we heard this year, too, Foster Griffin, maybe, too, was, was another one on the same date, I, I think yeah. I learned. I think so, a different year, but yeah. Different, different year. And, and so... Yeah, they will keep getting younger, and and that's great. Uh, I mean, um, uh, ultimately, we're all replaceable. Ultimately, even though old guys can stay in this game a long time, the game will pass us by. These players will be passed by. As Rex Hudler says all the time, the only thing guaranteed of a ball player is that at some point he'll be an ex-ball player but they'll replace them with more ball players and they'll replace them with more broadcasters, uh, whatever that looks like. I don't know. I mean, maybe in 20 years from now, the game will be broadcast on something that is like that version Snapchat or something. I, I don't know what it looks like in the future, but who would have ever thought that there'd be pre and post game shows yeah. the, the way that we do them now. And, and that that's, that's a part of the whole thing. And so, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to just be part of it. And, you know, to see all these young players come in. I tell parents all the time and, and the players too, but I think the parents grasp it more that the privilege of being able to capture that moment, whether that be our cameras or me getting to interview the parent in the stands or whatever right. it is, is such a privilege and such a, an experience that never gets old because you, you understand that they will never have that moment again. I'll, I'll give you this one. I, you know, and, and I know we'll get to it later, but, uh, my, my uncle reached out to me because I had written a chapter about Eric Hosmer in the book. And he said, hey, do you remember when Eric Hosmer hit his first home run? I said, yeah, Yankee Stadium. And he said, we were sitting, you know, like one row behind them when you came up to interview them. I'd gotten my uncle and aunt tickets at Yankee Stadium and they were sitting there like they were a part, not of the family, but they were right. there. And, and, and they'll never forget it. Right. I mean, like that was my uncle's memory when he got the book and he saw that Hosmer was written about. He's like, oh, I was there yeah. when that happened. And so those families will never forget them. And look, I, I've done hundreds of those moments yeah. and, and they're only a handful that forever will be in my mind because there's so many and it's their moment. It's really not mine. But 
you know, they usually want a copy of it. They usually want to be able to show it to the family. And, and somehow I end up in those videos, you know? So it's, it's such a cool thing that every year you get to see more of it and more of it. And it's that first for someone that has dreamed of this their whole life. And I get to be the one to sit down and talk to these proud yeah. parents about it. You, know, you ask about, do you have the greatest job ever? I mean, those are the moments that make it that. Well, you just answered my next question, uh, which was what's your favorite part of the job? So I think that's pretty much being able to be a part of history for those young men. Um, so let's switch to this. I, you've mentioned a couple of players, Hosmer and, and Salvi for sure. Who is your favorite Royal to be connected with, whether it's pregame, postgame interview, just chatting with in the, in the clubhouse, whatever, in your 13 years with the team, who is your favorite Royal? I think overall, and it's, there's so many layers to that question for me, maybe not for you, because the guys that I go in and just BS with in the clubhouse are often my favorite. They're guys that I have spent time with away from the field. Less and less of that now as I get older, but you get to know them. There are families like the Hosmers that, that I built relationships with that that'll be special to me beyond baseball. And so, you know, it's an interesting question because there's no one more fun than Salvi and what you see and what everyone sees on a nightly basis, it it's real. Yeah. I mean, that's, and, and I've got a great relationship with Salvi. The time that I spent with Eric Hosmer, as good as any athlete I've, I've dealt with, um, I actually wrote in the book that he only blew me off once. And it was a fun story of, of why, um, but basically he was protecting another, another player, but the most go-to accessible superstar. Yeah. And I will say that in Kansas city terms, he was a superstar. People around the country might not say, wait, well, he was a superstar. He certainly was here in Kansas city, yeah. but number one on my list has to be Alex Gordon. And I, I wouldn't do any wrong with going with either three of those guys who I've probably been around more than, than anyone. But you know, when I got here in 2008, Alex was in his second year. So Alex played 14 years in the big leagues. I covered 13 of them. And I, like many of us, watched him go from a, you know, young player to a young married player, to a little bit of an older father, to an older father of two, to an even older father of three. And I, I, I view Alex as much as any player on that team as a friend. And maybe that's a little bit easier to say now that he's out. And I feel like he's probably more one of us than he is them there. And there is yeah. a dividing line. Players are players. Right. We build relationships with them. But at the end of the day, they've got to go play and we've got to go write or talk about it. And, you know, those days are over now. I mean, I've seen him multiple times since he retired. I'm seeing him a little bit more socially and, you know, not like we're hanging out and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, you build these relationships and I, I absolutely treasure the time that I had, not just with him, but um, having had the chance to get to know his late father, to, to know his mother, who I absolutely adore, uh, his wife, his mother-in-law, his father-in-law. Uh, you know, that is such an amazing part that gets back to favorite parts of the job that to me, he would be my favorite guy. Cause I feel like, I, I feel like I watched him grow up and I watched his whole journey in, in my unique way. And, and that's something that that'll stay with me forever. Hey, I, I figured it would either be one of those three guys. I thought it might be Salvi. Uh, so I had a question for, for you related to Salvi, how much money have you spent through the years <laughs> on dry cleaning as a result of Salvador Perez? Well, I mean, if I wanted everybody to feel sorry for me and all this kind of stuff, I would, I would sit there and say, Oh my gosh, he's ruined so many suits <laughs> and, my dry cleaning bill is through the roof. But even before I had a local dry cleaner, I have a, a dry cleaner and I'll, I'll throw it out there. Uh, hangers, dry cleaners that at one point, I don't know, four or five years ago said, Hey, uh, we know you're not a customer of ours, but if you're willing to come in, we'd love to talk to you about something. And they said, we, we'd like to just do your dry cleaning. I'm like, well, I, I, mean, I can't really go on TV and do ads for hangers. I mean, that's, right. you know, that, that's a lot of money. I said, no, we just think it'd be cool to be able to be the ones to you know, tell people that we're doing your dry cleaning after it's all messed up. So the one side of it is it's, it's given me this great relationship with, um, with a company and they're, they're awesome to me. 
but the other side of it is when you wear a suit on an 80 degree day in Kansas City, whether you get doused with a Gatorade bucket or not, it probably needs to go in for dry cleaning. So, you know, it's not like he made my dry cleaning a necessity. He just made it a necessity to have somebody dry it out before it went in there sopping wet. So yeah. I would have to hang it, you know, in the garage or, or whatever it was. But I will say that that Salvi splash, which was completely organic the way it all became a thing there's nothing organic about the salvi splash i mean he decides he wants to do something and we go along for the ride and it's sort of scripted in his head and i have this sort of task of following his lead i mean i joke with him now that if we're going to win an emmy award for any one of these moments we're going to have to give him a director's credit on the emmy nomination because it's not our director, Steve Kurtenbach, in the truck saying, hey, move the guy this way. It's Salvi going, hey, so, uh, turn him. He's like signaling to me. Move him here. I don't want him to see me. I don't want him to see me in the Jumbotron. And I'm like, wait, wait, you know, your world, whatever you say. But I have never once suggested he do anything. I have never once asked him to do something. He will tell you that I asked him not to do it. And that only... That never happened. We argue about this. He likes to remind me of this. He says twice I got mad at him, which is total garbage. It was once that I got mad at him. <laughs> but he wants to exaggerate. And it was years ago. I don't remember when, but we were in Seattle. And it was like the start of a road trip. And so, you know, if we're doing nine or ten games on a road trip, I might pack three to four suits. And, you know, you could you could hopefully reuse those. And then you pack enough shirts so you don't have to go do dry cleaning on the road if possible. And it was like the first day in or the second day in. And instead of doing the Gatorade bucket, he took like four cups of blue Gatorade and just chucked it through the air. And I had a light colored suit on. And so everything was just dotted in blue. And so I just said to Mike Swanson, you know, the, the Royals vice president of media relations, I said, Hey, can you just tell Salvi like just to hold off on the cups? Like I could dodge the other stuff. And Salvi got wind of that and basically was like, oh, I'm going to hold that over your head. For, oh, you don't like it. I mean, like, he and I, he and I have a great, just such a fun, give each other crap back and forth Yeah, that I always know is just from the, the, just the most fun, entertaining place. And that's it. I mean, like I, I'm moving quicker when it's cold out. I really don't want to get cold. Yeah, I, I don't need any of the attention on this thing, but there are moments, especially during the heyday with all the winning, where there was a determination made in advance that I was going to be the target. And this would be discussions that happened with, you know, Salvi and Hosmer or whoever, Salvi and Duffy. And it's like, you know, it's my time. Uh, I mean... I would rather they just dump it on each other and I get out of the way and then everybody wants to know what it felt like. And well, it was cold is what it was, but I'd rather it be about them. But if they want to include me in the mix, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun that, that they want me to be a part of this little, little deal. It's Salvi's deal and, and whatever he wants to do, I'm, I'm fine with it. Did you have players that were difficult players or managers who were difficult to get to open up to you? Oh, sure. Uh, and and so in, in a strange way, some of them were guys that were much better about being open or friendly off camera than on. Hmm. And, you know, I'm constantly reminded that I do this for a living. And as I said earlier, it doesn't always come out the right way. It's not always smooth. There are good shows, bad shows, good interviews, yeah. bad interviews, bloopers and all that. But I'm never nervous or uncomfortable. And there are plenty of people including athletes or coaches that really don't like the spotlight, aren't comfortable with the spotlight, even with what they do. And so I think the two that stand out in my mind, and I would tell them this, or maybe I already did at one point, were Jason Kendall and Rick Ankiel. And I got along great with both of those guys before their time here, after their time playing, uh, as a matter of fact, I'd had a relationship with Rick from back when he was in St. Louis. And I, I, I believe that I was a 
very friendly and familiar face to him as he was, you know, trying to kind of put the past behind him and some of the struggles that he had had with pitching. And now he was a hitter and everybody still wanted to ask about that. And I, I think I was a friendly face, but once, once I got him on camera, it was like, you know, two word answers. I think he was just kind of in protective mode and Kendall was the same way. Uh, one of the smartest guys that I ever met in baseball. I just couldn't quite get it to where it needed to be. The irony of all that is Rick went on to be a really good television analyst. And uh, <laughs> so, you, you know, some guys, some guys I think would rather just avoid the media if they can. I, I never or very rarely have I taken that personally. I almost look at it as a challenge, like, okay, what can I do to help make this better? And a lot of that is just building those, again, those relationships and that yeah. trust and leaning on others that you've done it with. But, you know, as my kids say to me all the time, when I tell bad dad jokes, they can't all be winners. And, you know, they, they're not always winners. I had one, one year. I remember Ryan Lefebvre was so mad. Uh, Casey Kochman in we, we, like my first year or two, we used to interview a star of the game from the other side after a loss. And we kind of stopped doing that and, uh, which I was upset with at first because I, I just enjoy interviewing people and meeting new people. And I kind of came to realize that fans could care less whether we interviewed, you know, the the third star of the game from the other team because the first and second stars were probably going to their TV and radio. So we gave that up. But I remember interviewing Casey Kochman once one year with the Angels, first baseman. And I think every every answer was one word. And we finished it up. It was awkward. It was painful. I'm like, well, that, that sucked. And, and I remember Ryan Lefevre was just so – so mad that, you know, a guy would, would make so little effort. I don't know the guy. I don't really, um, I didn't find myself offended by it, but those are few and far between yeah. at, at the minimum guys know how to get out there and, and, and answer questions in a way that supports their team. Well, you were prepared for, have you ever been yosted? And I know you have, I've been there when you've been yosted, we've all been yosted. And we're obviously <laughs> talking about Ned Yost, when you say a beautiful blue sky out there, Ned, no, no, it's actually, yes, it's a beautiful blue sky. Uh, and he, my uncles were his agents when he was a player. So we have that and he is warm and friendly when I don't have my recorder in my hand, but I've been yosted. So I know you have been. So what is your favorite story about being yosted by Ned Yost? Oh man. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite story. I mean, certainly you had to be on your game and then you realize that you could be completely on your game. And as you said, it might not matter because you could have all your facts and your ducks in a row and he'd still look at it the other way. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, could you have a more perfect, beautiful day for baseball? No. I mean, look at the clouds in the sky. What, what, <laughs> what clouds? <laughs> yeah and but i also came to understand that some of it was just his personality of messing with people yeah and i always felt like the best approach to take with ned now keep in mind i come from st louis where i'd covered tony la Russa for a lot of years so i'm not saying ned was a walk in the park but i had already dealt with a manager that that could be difficult in answering things when you needed answers doesn't mean they didn't answer him Ned had plenty of good answers but oftentimes it could be like hey what are you expecting from Bruce Chen tonight I, the same thing I was expecting five days ago can't you just use that answer again <laughs> and I remember that answer with many times with, with yeah, all of us and I would I'd say like listen if you can identify who's going to start in every game this year I'll sit you down if it makes you happy and I will ask you, tell me why he was good. Tell me why he was bad. <laughs> tell me what more you need from him. And just give us like four or five answers for each guy. Well, you know, his, when his sinker's on, he's great. Okay, we'll use that one for Brad Kelly. You know, then we'll just cue him up. But you know as well as I knew that that's not going to happen. With that said, it did push me. I don't have a, a, a great example, but it, it, it pushed me to just try to ask better questions. It pushed me to also really build trust with the coaching staff. Like I don't have to hear it from Ned Yost. Right. I could hear it from Rusty Kuntz or Dale Swaim or, you know, whoever it might be, Terry Bradshaw now. And so if, 
if I can get the insight and the information I need from those guys, then if I get it from Ned, great. If I don't, I don't. Yeah. And what that enabled me to do was not be that thorn in his side every single day. So when I needed it and I had to be that thorn, fine. But if I don't need it today, fine, I'll get it from somebody else. And that's good. And yeah. the other thing is I, I learned how to throw a back at Ned without it being inappropriate or offensive. Yeah. And that's just really like, he liked that back and forth, but you had to know the right time and place for it. Cause if you got that wrong, then you're embarrassing him. And I'm certainly never going to stand up the manager. You can, that's not a good way to go about living every single day with them. So I don't know that I had a specific one. I, I think, you know, really the one that stands out to me is just interviewing him live on the field um, after one of their clinchers and it was actually after I believe that they had just knocked out the Toronto Blue Jays in the 2015 World Series. You can just hear the emotion in its voice. He kept referring to them as, as these kids and then had to keep stopping himself like they're not kids anymore. That one and then the last ever interview I did with him um, in, in his final game, you know, that he that he was retiring. And I, I think I had about four questions in my mind. And we're in the middle of the third and I could hear his voice choking up, which kind of got me choking up because I didn't think it was possible to, you know, hear Ned Yost choking up. Mm -hmm. And I, I just knew there were tears behind that, those sunglasses. And I was ready to ask one more, which was probably going to put him over the edge. It wasn't really my intent, but I just, I could feel the emotion and he's going on with his answers. He's like, he's going, he's going, and I'm ready for my next question. My last question. And he's like, thank you all so much love you all. Thank you. Or something like that. And he walked off and I'm like, Oh, he wasn't going to let me get anywhere. further. With this because he, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was going to yeah. struggle. And I don't know if he'll, he'd remember that or not. So, you know, it, it, it was an adventure. It wasn't always easy, but I never felt disrespected. Um, I, you know, he could have made our jobs easier at times, but I, it was never, ever, 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 ever personal with him. Yeah. And, and that's all you can ask for. Yeah. All right. The one I tell people about is I went to the post game or postseason presser when he changed the coaching staff and he talked about bringing in new coaches who could deal with young players. And I raised my hand and Swanee called on me and I said, well, Ned, you know, the, this group of coaches who led you guys to two straight pennants in the world championship came in when you had young guys. I don't want you to throw them under the bus, but why is this group? And I didn't finish and he just laid into me. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. And I'm just, you can imagine, I'm, I'm sure you were there. You probably don't remember it, but he just ripped into me. Well, that was the last question because nobody else had the courage to ask another question. So Swanee wraps us up and one by one, the media, all we all walk up to say goodbye. And I'm almost scared to, even though I know him personally through my uncles and he looks out and he goes, David, good to see you. Glad you're here. You know, have a good off season. And it was like, he had just answered my question eloquently. And when in fact he had blasted me. So you're right. It's not personal. He just doesn't like that part of his job. And sometimes, sometimes he has a little fun with not liking his job, that part of it. Yeah. I, and I will say that I have, and not that it's been a lot, it's been maybe three times, but I have had more either text or phone conversations with him since he retired than I ever had, you know, in yeah. his 10 years or so here. I, I never really felt the need to have to get a hold of him. You know, I, I, I sort of leave that to the beat writers. Like, you know, you need stuff in the off season, you need comments and all that. And so I just kind of left him alone. But now that he's retired, you know, on his birthday, I'll send him a birthday text. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. I needed comments for the book, he readily called me back. When I needed stuff about Alex Gordon, I was able to track him down when Alex was retiring. And, and I, I think I might've been one of the only ones to get him because I know the Royals used the quote that I got from him on their Twitter feed, which I, if that was indeed the case, I believe that I happened to catch him right before he was going out hunting for the day. And, <laughs> and so I got lucky because I, I asked him if he'd get on a zoom call. Cause I wanted to record him and he goes, Nope, going out hunting with Foxworthy. I'm like, I'll take whatever you got right now. Yeah. And, and so he sent me a text with a, with a statement, but he's, he, I think that now that he's out, some of that personality you were talking about, I mean, anyone that's ever seen Ned Yost speak to a group, make an appearance, 
sees a different guy than what you would see in the press conferences. It's a very charming, engaging, thoughtful, um, you know, introspective man. And, you know, I wish I could have brought more of that out at times, but at times he showed it. And, um, and, and I think that was certainly when he was at, at his best for us, but I've really enjoyed sort of seeing him post baseball right now. Cause he, at least to me in, in my limited you know, interaction seems very relaxed and and seems to be really be enjoying things. Well, we're running out of time, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk about your book. Tell tell us where it's available and just talk about what inspired you to write a book, what the book's about, what you, when I'm helping somebody with a book, I say, I've got two questions and they sound similar, but they're completely different. What's your topic and what's your point? Your topic is what you're writing about. Your point is what you want people to take away. Yeah. So what's the topic of your book? What's the point of your book and where can people get it? So the topic is the little things that add up, add up to the big things. And I'll back it up real quick because I think a lot of people, at least within the sports world, maybe didn't know that I was leading, you know, this, this other life. That's not all that different than this life. But about four years ago, a, a friend of mine said, you know, you, you should start a speaking business. And that didn't come out of nowhere. He would ask what I was doing in the off season. I've been asked to speak to a couple of groups I've spoken to groups for 25 plus years in television, but I'd never really done it as a business. It was a go speak to a rotary club or a church group, community outreach. Here's what's going on with the team. And, and then a couple of groups had had hired me to speak. And, you know, I thought, well, there, there are a lot of lessons in culture and leadership and, and I've got all these experiences from the Royals and the Cardinals and the Rams and all this stuff. And so he said, you should start a business. And so I, I did. And everyone said to me that knew the speaking industry, you have to write a book. And so I met with an author and she looked at me and she said, you're not ready to write a book. And I was <laughs> like, you know, I'd be offended if I wasn't thinking the exact same thing. All I was thinking about, you know, this is probably a handful of months or maybe a year after the Royals won the world series is I, I'm not the guy to write the 2015, you know, book about the Royals and the world series. There, there are people that do this for a living. And I, I guess I could write a how-to broadcasting book, but that's not that exciting other than a handful of people. So I don't know what I would do. And she said, why don't you start a podcast instead? So November of 2019, I started a podcast called Rounding the Bases. And the whole point was to really start meeting leaders and executives outside of the sports world and entrepreneurs. And I started telling these stories and you know, she said, you'll build content that way for speaking, maybe for a book one day, you'll meet people, you'll build a brand beyond baseball. And so it was rare that I would have a sports guest, but early on, I thought I'm going to ask everybody three baseball themed questions, professionally speaking in your business, what's the biggest home run you've hit? What's the biggest swing and miss you've taken? And what is small ball? What are the little things that add up to the big things? What are the singles and the bunts and the sacrifices and the defense and the stolen bases in your world that translate to home runs? And it hit me, I don't know, sometime a year and a half ago, I'm going to write about small ball. And then, as you know, as someone that's been through this process many, many more times than me, that it just evolved as it was going. Like what I thought it would be when I started kept changing and changing to the point where I finally settled on, I've got all these topics about small ball, trust paying attention to detail, um, purpose, reading people, what I call reading the room. Why don't I make each chapter an inning and there'll be a top half and a bottom half and one half will be a business story from someone that I met on the podcast and the other half will be a corresponding baseball story. So I could sit there when I do a chapter on paying attention to detail and that chapter is about Rusty Koontz, a deep dive into that. The business side is a guy named Sandy Kemper, who's the uh, CEO of a company called C2FO in in town. Or trust. Why did it take me seven years to gain Albert Pujols' trust? And then how does a guy like Jeff Jones come in, used to be a big wig at Target, and come into H&R Block and take over a company? And how do you build trust and take people into a new generation. And so it's a, it's chock full of those type of stories. And, and I think the cool thing, and you know, this as a writer is that when you start digging deeper, you begin to learn more about people that you never knew existed. Yeah. And so to hear the story of Raul Abanez's as parents and how they ended up in the United States and to learn more about how the Royals 
found Eric Cosmer and fell in love with exactly what he became were stories that I couldn't tell in the context of 30 seconds to a minute right. in a game, but now it was something that I could do um, in writing. And so it's, you know, it, it, it was a project that I knew that I wanted to do. I knew that it would, would help me with everything that I was doing with my, my business. But more importantly, I think I, I knew that I had stories to tell. And, and, you know, when you talk about the point of it all, I think that the book is full, especially at a time with, you know, so much negativity, the book is chock full of lessons from stories in and out of sports that can help people, not just with their business, but, but with their life and in going about things in a better way. And I know it's available on Amazon and in bookstores, but you make more money if they buy it from you. So where can they get it uh, from you directly? Yeah, you know that drill. There's a game to this one, right? Um, yeah, Amazon's fine. Um, it's been available and made in KC in Kansas City. And then my website, um, joelgoldbergmedia.com. And I can fulfill any orders too. People can email. Uh, I've got a little team. So people can email info at joelgoldbergmedia.com and happy to sign or do whatever it takes. So you'll you'll sign autographs if, if requested. Yeah, I mean, it might devalue things, but people seem to like that. So, you know, if... if if that if that is something that people want now, I've already gotten just destroyed on social media by Hosmer and what Merrifield was fe featured in the book, too, in a chapter called Don't Give Up. And, um, you know, I wrote them little messages in there and they, they were sure to share that on social media because my handwriting is somewhere in between a kindergartner. And I believe Ian Kennedy offered his like two year old son to, to do the signing for me. So. <laughs> It's up to you whether you really want that handwriting in there, but um, but it's it's been fun. Well, good. Well, it's it's always a pleasure to chat with you, whether it's at a hockey game or you know whatever. Uh, it reminds me that four of the most beautiful words in the English language, when strung together, are pitchers and catchers report. We are less than two months away from that. Hopefully, it will be at a normal time in February. But I'll look forward to seeing you out at Kauffman Stadium uh, for baseball this year. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, David. Always good to see you. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to Sports Connections with David Smale. Make sure to subscribe, follow, and rate the show from your favorite podcast platform. You can learn more about David Smale and his work by visiting davidsmalebooks.com. Don't forget to join us weekly for new episodes. Until next time.